I think the best thing about MIT is there is a lot of very exciting research going on. And I think it's a crime not to describe to you not like some of the most uh, interesting things. So first of all, how fast can modern computers be? We have all programmed on computers using MATLAB. But if you look at what modern computers can do, they are basically orders of magnitude more powerful than what we can do with MATLAB on our desktops. So this is some of the computers we have used in our group. So this is a computer called Mira. It's hosted in Chicago in the Argonne National Labs. It has about 50,000 nodes. A node is basically a, a computer, like one of the regular desktops. But they usually pack a lot of computing power in, in a node. And as you can see, because they have many cores in each node, they basically have about a million cores total in the computer. And it, the cool thing is you can use all these computing power as if it's a single computer. So you can, you can write a parallel code that runs, like that solves a single PD on all of these cores. So of course not everybody have access to this kind of computing power, but everybody do have access to, for example, Amazon Web Services. On Amazon nowadays, you can request basically instances, and each instance is like a node on one of these supercomputers. So, so for example, like uh, you can easily request about like uh, 200 and something instances that runs in parallel. Each instance has about 36 cores. So, so if you go go online, you fill out a form of requesting like 226 instances. Then you basically get a parallel computer of about 10,000 cores. That's not so bad at all, right? That's like 10,000 times more powerful than as if you coded something up in MATLAB. So being able to do this kind of parallel computing is not only available for like uh, top scientists and engineers in top universities, it's also available basically for everybody. So that allows us to do simulations that previously is not really uh, deemed feasible. So this is, uh, for example, uh, a simulation we did last year. Uh, Patrick is also involved in this. It's a simulation of a, of a flow of a, a turbine, uh, of, a, of a gas turbine inside a ga gas turbine engine. So as we can see, there is a, like a, a, turbul a chaotic turbulent flow going on. Previously, this kind of phenomenon can only be modeled. It cannot really be resolved from a first principle uh, equations. They can only be kind of a, uh, estimated through some kind of combination of empirical evidence and uh, physical argument. But now we can solve equations, Navier-Stokes equations, and uh, uh, predict this kind of uh, phenomenon from these first principle equations. So this is uh, news from uh, July this year, like several months ago, uh, and uh, from the White House .gov. Uh, there has been signed uh, what's called the National Strategic Computing Initiative to ensure the US continues leading the field over coming decades. So basically, the, it, it's a big chunk of money that that funds the development of even bigger computers. That is going to replace the a million core computer we just uh, saw that is running today. It'll be about uh, something about like a hundred times more powerful than this million core computer that is one of the largest today. So in the coming decades, we'll have hundred times more powerful computers and. Uh, things like this is going to keep going. At some point, if you compare a computer like that, a massively parallel computer, to a computer we are using here, it is like comparing a computer with like hand calculation. <laughs> so, so it's like uh, if, we keep, uh, if we just keep doing things like in a single node, single, single computer, that's like uh, sticking to hand calculations in, in, in the future. And one, why are we? Are, why are they keep pushing parallel computing? 
And uh, basically, it's in the same article, they cited, for example, computational fluid dynamics being an important tool in aircraft design. And, uh, but current technology, which is limited to smaller number of uh, computers, are, uh, can only handle simplified models of the airflow around the wing and under limited flight conditions. So the purpose of these bigger computers is really to enable us to design better things using a higher fidelity PD simulations. Okay, so that's basically what we learned uh, in this class. So, so the challenge I, uh, I'm trying to solve here is, is how much time it takes, even on the biggest computers, to solve these kind of problems. And uh, I think on the last project, you get a, a, a little bit of a sense of what a chaotic simulation looks like. And these high fidelity simulations we are running, they are much more uh, expensive than like uh, the aeroelastic example we saw, but they are also chaotic in the sense they produce time series it's like that. And what we are usually interested in is not the time series itself, but some kind of long time average. Right? For example, if you're interested in the efficiency of uh, an airplane, you're not just interested in any time series, you want the time averaged, for example, fuel combustion, the time averaged thrust of your engine. So this long time average is what we are looking for. And this kind of aperiodic signal forces you to perform the simulation for a very, very long time to get an accurate time average. And that's typically millions of time steps in a moderately difficult problem and <coughs> even more for, for problems that are more multi-scale in time. So, so that's, that's a big problem. And also, when we are doing engineering design, we are usually doing optimization, right? We are optimizing, uh, we're trying to get the best design. And the best optimization algorithms require something like a, a hundred simulations in the best possible scenario. If you combine each simulation running for millions of time steps, that right now takes usually days to finish, even on a, like a massively parallel computer. And uh, combine that with 100 simulations, they, they are just not fast enough to use in day-to-day -day engineering practice. So, okay, so, so here I'm basically introducing two topics. One is, uh, is the PhD thesis of uh, Matham, and another is the PhD thesis of uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, basically, how to optimize, how to, so one is how to run a simulation much, much faster than we can run today. But how to use the parallel computing better. And the other topic is how to do efficient sensitivity analysis and uh, adjoint-based optimization on this kind of chaotic simulations. That's Patrick's topic. So I'll have to step out uh, in a little bit, but like uh, I'm going to give you a few slides motivating their thesis and uh, let them take over. So Matham's topic is accelerating high fidelity simulation with extreme scale parallelism. So when you have a bigger computer, you throw the same mesh, same simulation onto more nodes, more cores, things doesn't automatically get faster. They get faster to a limit. Okay, this is a, 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 this is a simulator called Form 3 d uh, extensively used by NASA, SpaceX, uh, Boeing, and a lot of uh, other places. It's one of the best code in the world. But if for any given simulation, the parenthesis is uh, how many uh, how many cells uh, in the finite it's a finite volume code. So how how many control volumes uh, in the simulation? Some of them are 100, 150 million. Uh, the bigger ones are 600 million, and uh, there is also like uh, several billion uh, control volumes case. So they are big simulations. And the, the x-axis is how many cores, how many CPUs they use. At some point, the speed up, which is how much faster the simulation runs compared to running on a single core, single CPU, levels off. So you don't get more speed up when you are using a bigger computer anymore. 
Why do you think that's the case? Yes? Because you have to swap information about some of the columns. You, you're swapping a lot of information and not doing very much calculation on the internal of the local mesh. Exactly, because you have to swap information every time step, right? You advance to a next time step because you're decomposing the mesh into small chunks. And in final volume scheme, you need your neighbor's information to update each volume's uh, cell average, volume average. We still remember final volume, right? <laughs> right, so you need your neighbors to uh, construct a boundary flux, interface flux, and uh, accumulate interface flux to update the volume average. So in the communication, at some point, exceeds the amount of time it takes to do the calculation itself. That means you don't really gain any more by using more cores. So that's a problem. Okay, uh, I have an analogy that like uh, this this speed up when when you are using a small number of cores, it's like flying a subsonic airplane. If you are using a, more and more cores, it's like you hit the transonic effect. At some point, you level off the communication time overwhelms the computation time. That's when we call it a latency barrier. It's like the sound barrier encountering aerodynamics. So that's Matham's uh, topic, and Matham is going to talk more about it. The second topic is many high fidelity simulations in important aerospace applications are unsteady and chaotic, like the project you worked on. And high fidelity optimization with many design parameters in requires doing the adjoint stuff we talked about uh, last uh, Monday uh, on these chaotic simulations. And uh, uh, in these chaotic simulations, the adjoint, if you don't do anything to it, it diverges. And uh, this is a professor at uh, Edward Lawrence. So he, he was a professor at MIT in the, uh, like, in the, uh, Eeps. I mean, previously it's not called Eeps uh, department. So, so he has uh, he basically is the person who discovered chaos, and uh, he demonstrated chaos using this very simple model. It's an ODE of heat convection, where the three states are circulation, horizontal, and vertical temperature in equilibrium in these kind of uh, vertical cells. It's it's basically a model of of convective heat transfer between a cold plate and a hot plate underneath. It's driven by uh, thermal, uh, thermal gradient. So she can use an ODE to uh, three-dimensional ODE to describe this system. And the system behaves like that. So the solutions are very sensitive to small perturbations in the parameter. So let me, let me So what I what I did is I if we want to design with respect to some parameter. So here I'm simulating this system, Lorentz system, with a range of different parameters. The parameters are very only slightly different, so they are not very different. And I'm solving from a, a fixed initial condition. So if you see the white dots, do we all see the white dot on the screen? That's the initial condition. That's where all the simulations start. And I'm using a slightly different color, like the visible light spectrum, uh, from red to purple, to encode what the parameter is. So as you can see, as I go forward, uh, the colors kind of spread out because they are different parameters follow slightly different evolution equations. What's remarkable is they become more and more different, right? A as time goes on, the spread of these different simulations become more. If you change the parameters a little bit, that means after a while it becomes very different. It's like much more different than what you expect from such small difference in the parameter. This is a common characteristic of chaos. And if you, if you do the same thing with the, uh, the project you have just worked on, uh, you discover this. If you run your simulation with a range of different parameters, you see the same thing. Basically, if you change the parameter only a little bit, the simulation becomes completely different after a while. And here, you can see even slight difference meaning slightly different color or even looks like the same color now are in completely different places in the phase space. So how to do sensitivity analysis and adjoint to this kind of systems is what Patrick has been working on. And he is now able to scale that to full CFD simulations and he is going to be talking about that.